So when we're dealing with meat, the best oh, way hey. to preserve it is on the hoof. Let it live until you're hungry enough to kill it. But here in Maine, where the temperatures are dipping below freezing at night and hovering around 50s, refrigerator temperature, it'll last for four or five days. Uh, but you still want to cook all of that meat well done to kill any bloodborne pathogens and nasties. Likewise, when you're fleshing out and processing uh, the animal, you want to wear protective layers on your hands. Make sure you don't have any open cuts that are exposed to the blood. And you want to stay downwind, or excuse me, upwind. You want to stay upwind of that animal too, so that any uh, airborne pathogens that might get into your sinus cavities are going to be swept out and away from you. We're going to try to utilize as much of this porcupine as possible. This was a survivor from, actually, this was a animal from the wildlife rescue that didn't make it. So we're going to make sure that it had a purpose in its final days here as a, as a teaching tool. Notice how we're not using a knife here. We're separating the hide from the meat by pulling apart the fascia or connective tissue that attaches the hide to the musculature of the animal. Uh, the goal is that you have a nice scar-free hide that you can brain tan using the animal's own brains to tan the hide to create a soft fabric with no holes in it. If you do punch through, and small animals like this you can, um, you can always sew it together but now you have to be mindful when you scrape that glaze off of the inside of the hide, the cuticle, um, that you don't punch and make that hole even bigger. So. Caution at first saves a lot of time and energy later on. For bone tools, we could use the scapula as a, as a bevel one edge here, as a mini scraper to get all the fat off the hide. You want to get this fat off right, right. here especially because it'll burn the hide, it'll turn it clear, make it yeah. brittle. Yeah. Um, these ribs uh, for an animal this size are just too small. You know, if it were a deer, we could again use them, we could actually make uh, points for our arrows. Out, out of the ribs? Out of the deer ribs. Yeah, I've, I've actually made some. But these are just too small to use. Um, in fact, if you wanted to, just if you overcook, the bones get brittle enough to eat, just like a you know Kentucky Fried Chicken bone, you ever chew on the ends of the bones and get the marrow out? Oh, yeah. Um, or just add it to your stew until it gets so pliable and brittle you can chew on them. The cannon bone or femur and the fib tib, these can be used as sewing awls. Okay, even on a small animal like this, you want to, when you uh, hand drill the hole in both ends of your, your needle that you, you wear with the rock, you sharpen these until they're a point. You want to you take your hand drill with a little rock attachment stuck in and put a hole halfway through the needle, turn it over, and then put another hole until you get all the way through. If you try to go all the way through on one end, it's going to split the bone in half. Um, same here with the uh, bones of the arm. These make good sewing needles. They're a little too small for fish hooks. But as far as a keeper snare, remember that keeper snare we did? Yes. You can sharpen this to a point and put it in that peg hole so that the animal is drawn into that spike. And uh, yeah, the two bones in the lower arm and the upper arm are good for that. I use the teeth on porcupine and beaver. Um, they're really useful uh, mini scrapers. Once you get your hide off, including the skull there, you've got enough quills to start your quill working career. And I can't say I've ever tanned a porcupine hide, but look at that. All those quills, you can put them in natural dyes and um, use them for some amazing artwork. Especially on buckskin or birch bark baskets. And now we're ready to process the meat. First part is we're going to remove the tail and then uh, we're going to start quartering the animal so that we have Basically, four drumsticks and a rib cage and back meat section that we're going to put on a spit. We can use the sinew on larger animals, and if you had to use the sinew for cordage, it's the back strap sinew that runs parallel along the spine that we'd be after. The, the tendon and the legs of this particular animal is just too short. It would be, you know, might be able to uh, put some fletchings on an arrow shaft, but harvesting, the amount of time you use harvesting that sinew and sacrificing meat, it just isn't worth it. We're going to 
take out the intestines and uh, other internal organs, the first thing you want to do is very carefully cut around the anus and the reproductive glands. Some animals have a scent gland that you need to be mindful of, memphitis, memphitis, or skunk, striped skunk. Um, if you're cautious, you don't have anything to worry about. Notice how when we make the cuts, the, your finger, your lead finger, your pointer finger is up close to the point of the blade so you don't make too deep of an incision. Am I going to cut through this bone here? Help yep. Bone? Okay. There you go. Always keeping your blade up and away from the internals. And now just unzip like a coat. Right up the middle, again with that knife, really careful not to puncture any of those internals. If we do this right, there's no blood. And the sack of organs will come out in one piece, but we've got to go all the way up the middle. Be mindful, it's going to smell a little funky for if you've never done this before. Um, and you don't want to inhale a lot of that. There you go. Straight up into the diaphragm now. See how easy it is to cut through the sternum? It's tougher on animals bigger than this. Rac adult raccoons, um, fox, and coyote, they're, they're really hard to get up through. And if you're having trouble, pick one side or the other and just start reefing. There you go. Uh, at this point, am I doing right by peeling away this side thing? Or? Yep. You want to open that up? That's diaphragm right there that you're tearing. Oh. You're still going to have to cut all the, the tubes. Unless you can pull them right off the spine and pull from the top where the shoulders meet. All of that, all of those tubes that connect lungs and arteries, pull them straight down along the spine towards the pelvis. Where this was frozen, it might be a little harder. There it is. Oh, show us, show the home viewers what they've won. So just pulling all those tubes, and if you want to hold the top straight up so gravity can help you and it wants to flop down, there you're perfect. All right, and it's just a matter of pulling all the tubes from the neck straight down to the pelvis, so the organ sac all comes out in one in one motion. Again, if this animal wasn't frozen, this would go a lot smoother. And there it is, folks. Oh, you've got the digestive fluid, so hold that up high. That is porcupine urine. You might want to stand up before it drips on you. <laughs> but notice how nothing got on the meat. Yeah. All right. So there's the gut pile. There's the clean meat. And there's the porcupine urine that almost tainted the meat. But because we did it the right way, starting from the top and peeling down with gravity helping us, when the uh, bladder did erupt, it erupted outside the body cavity. So we've still got some good, all of it, good edible meat. And you can tell because of that fresh pink look. Once the digestive fluids hit the meat, it almost instantly turns it an off color, kind of a greenish, grayish. And uh, we got away lucky on that one. All right, so next step is we're going to find a new bench and then we're going to quarter this puppy. <laughs> oh, where have you been?